Heather Frizzell is superintendent of schools for Fox Lake School District 114 in Illinois. She previously served as director overseeing special education as well as an elementary and middle school principal. As a leader, Heather is involved in response to intervention, closing the gap for special education entitled students, professional learning communities, literacy curriculum development, data analysis, and staff development. With experience as a building and district level administrator, curriculum specialist, and classroom teacher, she has consulted with districts throughout the United States and presented at national conferences. Heather received the Those Who Excel Award in Illinois in the school administrator category. She is also a co-author of Yes We Can, General and Special Educators Collaborating in a Professional Learning Community. I could go on and on and on about Heather Frizzell, but we're gonna get to know her tonight. So without further ado, let's welcome to a conversation with Brian, Heather Frizzell. Hey, Brian, how are you? I am great. I am great. I am so happy that you are able to do this. I'm honored that you're on. And, you know, one of the things I do at the beginning of all of my shows, Heather, is to really ask the, my guests to share about their, their personal journey, their professional story as, as much as you'd like. So who is Heather Frizzell? But, okay, now that's a loaded question, Brian. <laughs> um, I want to start off by thanking you for letting me be a part of your journey. It means a lot to me, both um, personally and professionally. I consider you not just a colleague, but also a friend. So well, I appreciate it's it. It's kind of like hanging out together with someone yeah. that I really appreciate. Yeah. Well, well um, And I want to thank you for that warm introduction because you kind of helped me fast track through the professional side of the journey by talking about lots of the things that I've been blessed to do during my career. I think an huh. interesting thing that people don't know about me is I never set out to be an educator. Really? Um, I grew up in Southern Indiana in a small town and my dad owned a lumber yard. And so, and he and my mom split when I was young. And so one of the ways I stayed connected with my dad was during the summers, I would work at the, the lumber yard in the office with them. Okay. And so he and I kind of cooked up this plan. And this was before like big box lumber stores like Menards and Lowe's or, or right. whatever that is where you are, um, our amazing viewers who are taking their time to watch this podcast. Um, so we cooked up this idea that, that he and I were going to, be in this business together. And so I started at Indiana University as a business major um, because I thought I owed it to my dad. That's what we had said we were going to do. And what I quickly learned is that I was not at all passionate about that. Um, going to class was a chore that I found pretty quickly I wasn't good at because I found more interesting uh, things to do and um, was kind of struggling. Um, like I think lots of, of young adults are as they end that post-secondary journey of what am I, I'm at this place, what am I supposed to do? Whether that's college, career, vocational, just what's my next step to being right. an adult? And sadly, my dad passed away in the first semester of my sophomore year in college, very unexpectedly. Wow. Um, so like with anything, you make the best of hard situations. And, and what that created for me was the opportunity to not study what I felt like I had to, sure, but study what I really wanted to. Um, and I've had lots of moments of, I think, divine intervention along my personal path so far. And out of nowhere struck this idea that why, you know, and I had taught vacation Bible school. I have been around kids. I'm an only child, so I didn't have a sibling experience that maybe helped me pick <laughs> pick a service-based field for kids. Yeah. Um, but I'm I wanted to teach. Wow. Um, and my my mom and my stepdad were fully behind that. They had seen my discomfort to try and be the the square peg in a round hole of a business yeah. major. Yeah. Um, and so they embrace that. <laughs> they embrace the financing that cost us an extra semester to make that happen. Um, and I started on the pathway to what I think is just absolute magic. Um, and I feel very blessed for that. So I was a classroom teacher for about five years. I taught second grade um, where I came in with a, another brand new teacher very cocky and arrogant with wow. three other yeah. very veteran teachers who yeah. I would get frustrated at that 
didn't appreciate us and you know looking the the, the rear view mirror is pretty powerful yep. <laughs> um i can kind of see why um sure. it wasn't so easy to work with us so there was definitely two sides to that coin um and then became an instructional coach and in actually the school district where i grew up so i was working with my former teachers to help them embed technology wow their learning as part wow. and as an outcome of getting my master's degree and then we moved up to the chicago suburbs um, some changes in my personal life led to that happening, um, became an instructional coach in a suburban Chicago school district, immediately uh, was tapped as a leader, and I don't take that for granted either, um, by one of the superintendents there, um, was blessed to get my first assistant principalship, and then my first principalship was actually in that same building. Um, so it was the perfect connection to have yeah. been there and then grow into the role as a principal. What's interesting about that is I had my oldest daughter, Katie, on June 15th and took over as the principal in that school on July 1st. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So, you know, kiddo in the pumpkin seat right beside you. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was crazy, but it was great. But, but you made it work, right? We made it work. We yeah. made it work. So I was the principal there, um, then changed districts up to be um, a, an elementary principal in Kildare 96 which I think is a real pivotal life moment for me on several fronts. So that's where I met Tom Maney, who's one of the co-authors of Learning by Doing. He's one of my heroes, one of my mentors. He's amazing. Uh, same. He He's an amazing person. He's a tough superintendent in all the right ways sure. to, to grow you. Yeah. Um, and so most of the time I loved him. Sometimes I didn't. And it was those moments that I didn't that really made me better. Yeah, I was going to say um, that's that's like that's like a coach when they're they're pushing you out of your comfort zone and and you're like, I don't want to do this. But you look yep. back and you say, wow, I'm so glad somebody was there to, to do that and push me. Exactly. Because I wouldn't I wouldn't be the person I am now had I not had that. Um, and I mean that sincerely. So. In addition to growing my skill set as a principal and as a collaborator in a true professional learning community, yeah. every place I'd been prior was PLC lighting right. at best. Yeah. So we would group, not team. We would yeah. collaborate, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not not in the ways that I came to understand because I was I was literally learning by doing. Sure. I was also surrounded by greatness in so many colleagues, but two that are are my soul sisters and yours too, yep. I think. Um, we're Julie talk about them. Yeah, we're gonna talk about <laughs> Julie and, and, um, and Jeannie. Jeannie. Yeah, so because, we'll come to them. So yeah. just had the opportunity to meet so many people professionally, but then spin another plate where Tom graciously connected me to two of the primary influencers in my life, which were Rick and Becky Dufour, yeah. um, who saw more in me than I ever thought was in there and um them along with bob aker obviously and of course we've lost rick and becky but bob is still um texted me on the reg um helped me see that it's not just about doing what you do where you are but how can you take that forward on a broader scale to share what's working yeah. i had never considered that as an option um either as a proficient public speaker other than you know with my people in my sure. squad so that's kind of the story of me on the professional field. I'm also blessed to be a mom. I have three kids, Katie, Brayden, and Taylor. Um, Katie is a sophomore in college. Brayden is an eighth grader. Taylor's 11. My husband, Sean, is also an educator. He teaches eighth grade social studies. He coaches everything. Yeah. Um, and then I'm currently, good good grief, I'm, I'm in my office as superintendent of schools in Fox Lake, which you highlighted in, in our intro, um, blessed to serve the Oh my gosh, the the absolute amazing people, parents, students, staff um, that I get to work with here. It's just, it's an honor. It's you know, an honor to get to do all the things that I get to do. So that's that's me. And, and that's an amazing you. And one of the things that I I just really appreciate about you is, and I and and I knew this right away. It's just your your humbleness, but it's also it's a fierce humbleness. It's not you know I'm gonna. You know, just be humble and just, you know, let things slide. I'm going to be humble about just the people who have helped me along the way. You know, you know, you talked about, you know, Rick and Becky and and Tom and, and Bob and and um, Jeannie and Julie and, and all the people who have helped you along the way. And I think, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about, appreciate about you is the way that you pay it forward. Right. And so um, and, and I'm, I'm going to jump into 
women who lead in a few seconds because I want to talk about Hannah, uh, Becky's oh. daughter's forward because it's really heart, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. But um, one of the things that I have noticed about you is, is that ability to influence in such a great way. So on social media, pretty much every day, um, I open up Facebook and I see a quote or something that's inspirational from Heather Frizzell. And my question is, you know, why do you, why do you feel the, the need to do that? You know, I, I spoke with, you know, Tina Bogren was on our show um, a few weeks ago and she was wonderful. And one of the things- She's that, amazing. She's yes, an amazing she human being. One of the things that she said, and I, I, I wrote this down, I want to teach what I need to learn the most. And what she meant by that is that she she wants there, there are things that she wants to learn, but she needs to teach that to get better. Is that, that learning by doing? Yep. When you post those quotes, are you posting those for others or for yourself? Um, I'm going to be brutally honest. So I've been posting those things for six years. Yeah. And um, they're part of my morning routine. So when I get up in the morning, I check my texts hoping that there aren't any because a text signifies something's yeah, probably yeah. not ideal. Yeah. Um, I check my email and then I go into Facebook and I have, as you can imagine, Brian, folders and folders and folders of images that I've just grabbed that have struck me over time. And it honestly um, is way more about setting my intention to be yeah. my most authentic self for that day. Sure. And so I find something that speaks to me as that's it. Yeah. That's what I'm striving for today. Um, I need a laugh to start my morning because I'm getting uh -huh. way too deep on the stuff I don't need to. Yeah. Um, like today's was look at the, look at you. You're amazing. Say yeah. it to yourself. Yeah. I needed that today. So yeah. to be really honest, it's kind of self-serving. It's part of my morning routine that I find what I need. Right. to get my mind right for the day, no matter where I'm starting to get me back to a place where I can be my best, most authentic self. Yeah. And I post it and it's interesting to watch who it speaks to. Oh, it, oh my um, goodness. It's, it's amazing. You know, Heather, one of the things again, and I, I, I so appreciate you being so honest and because, you know, what Tina talked about a few weeks ago was, is that idea of, educator wellness and self-care and how we need to take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. Yeah. So you're actually taking care of yourself, but in a byproduct of that is the number of people who, who like you said, it speaks to. Have you gotten a text from Brian Butler a couple of times saying, Heather, you talked to me today, yeah. you know? I get, I get a text from somebody every day. Yeah. That says, you have no idea how much I needed that. It's timely uh -huh. for somebody. And if somebody, it's interesting because if somebody gets the sense, like if I post too many kind of downer ones for a while, right. I'll have people to, okay, girl, are you okay? Yeah. Are you all right? Which, yeah. which I love, I love, but Brian, every single day, somebody in my friend circle will text and say, you have no idea how much I needed that. And so why do I do it? I do it for me. But then that also tells yeah. me in some little way, that small act is causing ripples. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And and that's a powerful that's a powerful thing to get to do. Yeah. Well, keep doing it because it really does, yeah. you know, help us all, and uh, most importantly, it helps you as well. It does. It hey, does. let's 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 dive into this wonderful book. And I I, I, I love seeing I get, all your post it. I get it. I get laughs all the time. I know you know Ken Williams laughed at me, and, <laughs> and Tina was you know very excited about it, but. Um, I, I, you know, read the book and I read your chapter and, and we'll get into your chapter, but I wanted to start off with, you know, somebody who was very dear to us. And, mm -hmm. and I, I um, actually have a hard time even kind of broaching the subject without, you know, tearing up and, and really struggling. But um, Hannah, um, Becky's daughter wrote the foreword. And I just want to read something from the foreword. Um, and I want you just to respond to it sure. because I, I think, um, the idea of giving and the idea of compassion and the idea of this, and Hannah speaks to it in, in, the, in her forward, the idea of Becky being so curious um, is, is, is really important. But I just want to read the end of Hannah's forward, and I just want you to talk to it. She says, 
May you always remember your purpose and know you are more capable of affecting positive change than you realize. Our schools need more curious, compassionate, and courageous leaders like you. This book is full of oh. wonderful, wonderful educators. You know, Yvette Jackson, Janelle Keating, you know, Jasmine Kular, Tina Budgren, um, Julie Smith. I mean, I, I could go on and on. And that quote speaks to everything that you all are about. But, you know, talk to it in terms of what it meant to you to have Hannah write that forward. And then, you know, that that particular quote at the end, what does it speak to in terms of the essence of our profession? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I wouldn't, I'm still stunned that I look at this book and my name's on it. Um, and that I got to write for it. It, it is one of the most humbling things that's ever happened. So I want to acknowledge that and the fact that Jasmine and Janelle from everyone they, they know invited me into this journey is mind boggling. Um, and I'm gonna have a hard time talking about it as well. So we we had all kind of the, the co-authors had bounced around, you know, who's gonna write the forward. Yeah. And then the idea of Hannah writing it um, got footing and started to become this magical real thing. Sure. But I hadn't read it. I, I had read the final version of my chapter. Right. I hadn't seen anything else until I held the book in my hand and opened it immediately remembering, oh my goodness, yeah. um, Hannah's writing this. And I got not even a paragraph in it and was hysterical. And my yeah. husband, Sean came in and he's like, what is there, is something wrong? You know, like, yeah. like, no, something's so right. I can't believe I'm a part of something so right. Um, so I read it and it just squeezed my heart and rocked my soul that Hannah did this, that she captured the essence of what we were trying to do um, and saw it and we pulled it off and yeah. then wrote not just from her perspective, but from Becky's, who is someone that yeah. changed everybody yeah. with um, who she was, just the light of who she was. Um, I can think of times when, when I would have a conversation with Rick and Becky together and Rick would come at something a little bit rough yeah um as he did and it was right and then yeah. Becky would be kind of the hug behind it going yeah. oh yeah okay yeah okay yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. <laughs> just her grace in class like if I could if I could ever have somebody talk about me ever the a portion of how I feel and talk about Becky I'm good <laughs> like it's yeah, she mission it's, accomplished it's even it's almost hard to put into words the kind of person that that she was yeah um but the words that hannah put on those three pages literally felt like becky was speaking through her it did it did and it was just it was like a the most big hug i've ever gotten yeah so when we look at that last statement and what does it mean i you know i think honestly brian you could take the word schools out of that and just put our world anywhere. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a story that I can about the book that's, that's happened already, but uh, as an educator and as an educator of educators, um, and as a learner, uh, nothing is more true of the fact that we are change makers yeah. and you choose what kind of a change maker you're going to be. You choose if you're going to make a positive difference yep. or if you're, and that's not to say I'm a Pollyanna, like give me, no. a pro, I'm not saying this is an easy walk, but you choose how you tackle it. You choose yeah. to focus on a problem or focus on at least finding a solution. Yep. And, and that's what I took from it is being curious because it's, it, it's, this is life school. The world is a roller coaster ride of constant challenge, yeah. but if we're kind through it, and curious about it, seeking to find not perfect, but better yeah. for us and, and anyone in our influence atmosphere, that's that's the place I wanna live. Yeah. That's where I wanna devote my time and energy. Um, and that's what I seek out in the people around me. So, I mean, we're obviously heading into the beginning of a school year. It's hiring high season. Um, yeah. you You can teach people anything. 
but nobody's willing to learn unless you come at them with compassion and care yeah. and they come at a situation with curiosity. So if I'm picking right now, we're interviewing for a mental health specialist between somebody who knows, knows all the stuff, yeah. but comes off as someone I, I perhaps wouldn't want to sit with and somebody who may not be an expert in their field yet at all, yeah. but brings to it the heart, soul, and compassion that I want my students to be around. You can guess who I'm going to go with every single time. Yeah. You know, there, there's another piece to that as well. And I think you're very good at this. I think, you know, all, all my, you know, colleagues um, who I've, I've known in the consulting world um, are, are seem to be very, very attuned. My colleagues who are really close to me in terms of the ones I communicate with, but that idea of vulnerability, mm -hmm. you know, we, we can't be experts at, at everything. We can't know everything. And I, I heard what you said, you know, there's no per perfection. You know, we're just trying to get better. It's just progress, right? Yeah. I see that idea of vulnerability to, to, to be able to be a leader and say, I don't know how to do this very yeah. well. We're going to learn together. I've made mistakes. Let's let's kind of, you know, go back to the drawing board. I, I think when we do that, it gives the people who we're leading the the the, the opportunity to, to take a breath and say, I don't have to be perfect. Right. Perfect's not the target. No. You know, the way I've started thinking about this, Brian, is, and I talk about this a lot when I'm facilitating learning, is we need to take off our self-inflicted superhero capes that we have to be perfect at and, and the best at and everything to everyone, yeah. because it's exhausting. And that superhero cape starts to feel like it's made of solid steel and yeah. it just brings you down and wears yeah. you down. Yeah. And, and instead, if, if we were to value in ourselves, well, first of all, honor the fact that we're, we're each of us, like I'm good, really, really good at a few things. Yeah. And I know that. Yeah. And then there's this whole category of stuff that I'm not good at yet. And another category of stuff that no, that's just not me. Yeah. That's just not me. And look at ourselves as a puzzle piece. And I'm bringing forward my pieces of greatness and look at others for their pieces of greatness. Sure to create not these independent puzzle pieces of way down, but rather this amazing landscape yeah. of the essence of all of our strengths. First of all, it makes life easier for me. Second, I feel more valued in who I am and not who I am not. Yeah. And wow, what a community we build when we view each other through what are the assets we bring yeah. well, that's rather than I have to be it, do it. I, I have to be the best. No, together, let's be the best we can. Yeah, that's that's the PLC at work process, that collective, that collective intelligence, right? It's like absolutely how and constantly work. saying, Yeah, how can we get better? How can we yep. celebrate, preserve, and protect yep. what we've done well? Not because we feel good about it, but because we've got proven results. Yep. Keep doing those things while we strive to get even better for the students, for the learners, for the systems that we serve. And stop beating ourselves up. If we make yeah. a mistake, we come back to the drawing board or come back to the table with new information that actually is going to help. Absolutely. Us. I was just in a data protocol session, um, and this is the way we've started talking about data in, in our district. And I wish it would have come to us, you know, years ago. But no matter what story your data tells, it's a celebration. Yep. And stick with me in this. So if the data whatever that data is, whatever the artifacts are, af affirm and align to what you aspired to, to your SMART goal, to the targets mm -hmm. that you've set. Right. Obviously you wanna celebrate that. Look at the processes, the practices. What did you do to get that? And wow, keep doing it. You've established right. your own local best practice. You know, cross check it with some yeah. research, but I'm guessing before you even set the plan, you were looking at Hattie's work. Yeah. You were looking at things going, well, wait, we don't, let's get ahead of this. Yeah. But I would also challenge us to think about when the data doesn't do what we aspired to. Rather than beating ourselves up when being like human pinatas of how bad we are, all the mistakes we made, can we just look at that and say, okay, let's take that practice, that system, that structure, that whatever, and set it over here and, and not consider that now. Right. Because we just got smarter. Sure. And now all of the options out there just became more manageable for us. So can we look at it as no matter what the data tells us, it's a celebration that just made us smarter rather than one is a win and one is a, a loss or you stink or an opportunity to beat ourselves up. I mean, I, I think that could be really revolutionary. It's working for us, particularly coming off the last sure. two years where we have more kids behind than we ever had. Um, 
And rather than, yeah, those kids, that data, that, no, okay, what did we do? Because that wasn't as effective as we wanted to. Right. So what else can we either add to it or shift about it? And how can we get around it together, identify it together? Because then we all have collective ownership yeah. to do whatever the it is. And that mindset, Heather, really just really just helps us not look out the window. It really just yeah. continues to say, okay, yeah. let's look here um, and say, what do we need to do yeah. to get a little bit better? It's not look in the mirror and say, you, you're terrible. It's like look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm proud that we tried. Yeah. Try something different because obviously this is not working. Right. And that's cool. Great. Let's not do that anymore. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, let's jump into your chapter because I think, you know, one of the things about uh, the book, and again, I, I love the book. Thank you. The, the title, Women Who Lead, um, being a, a superintendent, a woman superintendent, but a superintendent first, and then you're a woman who is a superintendent, but it's there, it comes with challenges and, and we, we cannot sugarcoat it. It comes with some bias. It comes with some preconceived notions. Actually, before we get into your chapter, you know, have you what kind of um, challenges have you experienced coming up as a teacher, especially I, I read Jasmine Kular's um, chapter and she talks about when you're an elementary administrator or teacher as a woman, it's, it's harder to, to aspire to be a superintendent. More women come from the middle school and high school yeah. um, level as and then they go into the superintendent. Talk about some of the challenges that you've experienced, but also the opportunities that you have in helping other women see that this is possible. Yeah. Um, so I want an unchallenge I've had, and I think, um, and this, and it connects the dots between what you're speaking of. Sure. I try to be for others what others have been for me. So okay. in my first teaching position in, mind you, rural Indiana, I had a strong, fierce female superintendent. Great. And it blew my mind that she had a job. Right. It blew my mind that she wasn't connected in the community. It wasn't a gimme job. Betty earned it. Her name was De sure. it's Betty Poindexter and she is an absolute rock star. Um, and she didn't take anything from anyone while also having so much grace, so much class and yeah. so much knowledge. So my first role model to even think sure. about maybe someday thinking this was was somebody I aspired to be right um she she gave me and my principal who was a man saw whatever it is that I didn't yet see and said you know lead on lead on how do we get behind you how do we give you opportunities like serving on at that point in time awesome. the building's yeah. leadership team um I, I've been blessed to have so many people along my path yeah. that have been a cheerleader so that when I hit a blocker who starts a statement like, well, but as a woman, yeah, I not only have my own <laughs> fairly fierce uh, personality to come at things, but I also know that I have both my real and my kind of virtual cheerleaders who sure. have shown me and help me believe in the fact that that talk is uh, challenge accepted. Yeah. Challenge accepted. Um, all you're gonna do is tick me off with a statement like that and I'm gonna challenge accept to, to prove you wrong. Um, and that's been my mindset forever. Um, and, you know, there's one instance I can think of and, and um, that really tested my patience and actually was kind of the impetus to dig in on this chapter. So I think it's a, I think it's a relevant point. Sure. Um, I was working with a school site um, with a, with a male principal who was very opinionated, um, very male dominant. Um, I think a little uh, intimidated by a, a strong female mm -hmm. coming in, especially in a consultative role. Yeah. And so he worked really hard, although he had opted into this work, right. he worked really hard to, um, gosh, just like dirty dancing, keep baby in the corner. Yeah. Just do your thing, do your things. Right. We're, you're here to maintain the status quo and affirm that what we're doing is, is good. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't good enough. It was good, it wasn't good enough. Um, and so I had to have a sit down conversation with him and, and I enlisted the strategies that, that you see in my chapter. Yeah to come at this guy. And I can't say that I changed how he believed in women. 
but I know how he, I changed how he at least would work with me. Sure. And that's all I wanted. I don't, I don't, you know, you can't you change. Be, you believe by belief, action and but, I can't change how change somebody believes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I reflected a lot on that conversation, um, both because it was infuriate. Well, three reasons it was infuriating. Um, it was effective and it led to a better relationship. Sure. I'm like, okay, there's something to this. And I mean, there's so, Jen Abrams does an extraordinary job uh, talking about difficult conversations. This is my no means Heather's idea. I just tried to pull kind of the best of the best from my story. Yeah. Say, Here's how I use these things. Cause flashback to that puzzle piece analogy, those pieces don't always click together smoothly. Yeah. So you have to have these conversations. You yeah. have to care enough to confront, not because you're cruel, but because you're passionate. And that's life. There, there's nothing that we do almost on a daily basis that doesn't, you know, have us, ha you know, dig deep to say, okay, I, I need to say this. I need yeah. to say this, but say it in a way. And, and again, I have to be honest, I'm not always great at this, especially if, personally. <laughs> I mean, yeah. sure people can tell me yeah, you're not saying this in the right way, but I think every day we're confronted with an, um, an opportunity to have a conversation that matters and have a conversation that really can move things forward. And again, right. I, I, I'm a work in progress and I need a lot of support, but I, I think- Well, I think we all are. And the more it's emotionally entangled, the harder it gets. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's why, you know, the tool that we created, and honestly, I hadn't made the tool in the chapter until I submitted the first v version in. And they're like, you need to snap all this into a tool. So people have kind of like yeah. a- graphic organizer for a brave conversation. I was like, oh, yep. yes, he's like, I would jot thoughts, but yeah. now it's here. It's now really it's cool. Here. So let's and get into the, not a fill in the blank. It's not a fill in the blank. Like you don't no. need every part, but you should be thinking about all those parts. And, and I was just talking, just talking to a colleague where if you're too emotional to work through all those parts, you are not ready. Yeah. For this to happen yeah. you are not so time yeah. out you know take a step away yeah yeah so your chapter is called braving difficult conversations and i i really like you know the the what the why and the how and i'm going to ask you to kind of talk to 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 those but you start the conversation with brene brown's quote choosing our own comfort over hard conversations is the epitome of privilege and it corrodes trust and moves us away from meaningful and lasting change mm -hmm. Didn't she say it? Mm, Renee. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the way that the way that I look at this is we have two choices, temporary discomfort yeah. or long term dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah. How, what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? Yeah. And especially as a leader, you know, I can't remember the quote exactly, but it's like, you know, the, the, the worst behavior that a leader accepts it really sets the tone for the culture of that organization. It's something it sure like, does. You know, so I think it's really um, something that we have to learn. And it's, it's, it's a skill. It's not something that's intuitive. You know, no. we have to and practice. it's hard. Yeah. This is hard. Things, right? And so, and so one of the things that you start off with um, is really making sure that we understand what a brave conversation is. Um, well, you and you know why? Becky Dufour, clarity precedes confidence. Yeah. 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 Let's not try to be good at something if we're not completely clear about what it is we're talking about. Yeah. And so what is a brave conversation? A brave conversation, gosh, just kind of put in my words, and I'm going to take like the wealth of so yeah. much knowledge that's out there together. And and it's it's confronting something in a way that you're looking for better, not right, yeah. not wrong, but better. And so it's when when you're coming at something with differing opinions, and it can be one person to one person, a person to a group, a group to a group, a person yeah. to a community, like flashback to our COVID times. Um, and you're you're tackling something that there are differing perspectives on, lot typically lots of emotion around, and it really matters. Yeah. And if it's not dealt with it's going to be a barrier to things getting better for whoever's in, impacting. So that, that to me is it, is, is it really matters. There are differing perspectives and, and there are repercussions to whether you do it or not and more positive repercussions for others, for you, for the system, if you choose to break it. And I, I, I very purposely call it a brave conversation 
versus or maybe complementary to uh, critical or crucial or hard. I'm not yeah. saying it's it it's not those things, but I think there's some connotations to those words. Yeah. And and brave feels like it's not easy, but it's it's a challenge rather than a, a struggle in a conflict. Um and I just like I, I just like reframing it in that way. Yeah. How do you how do you help people because you you know when you're having a conversation with somebody a colleague we're all bringing our own yep. you know things to the table mm -hmm. right and and so we may care deeply about an, a situation and, we, and, and want it to be successful but we have so much that's on our shoulders through life experiences how do we sift through all of that to get to common ground well and i think you just said it First of all, if, if you're coming at it trying to win, you're not in a brave conversation. Yeah. You're you're in a I'm in it to win it. Yeah. Uh, at best a lecture, <laughs> at worst a cat fight. Yeah. Um if you're starting at a place of striving for common ground where we can land in a place where we appreciate each other's perspectives and are able to to ideally move together from a common perspective, now that starts to feel like the sweet spot. Yeah. It, it involves listening, listening not to respond, but listening to hear. And I think those are two very, very different things. To listen to respond is the whole time you're talking, Brian, I'm thinking about what am I gonna say back? What am I gonna say back? As opposed to listening to really strive to understand where that person's coming from. Not making assumptions about it. Right. Just just because someone has always blank, well, that defines them. No, listen. And a strategy that I've had to use to get better at that, both because I function yeah. fast. Like I'm I think I think most of us are go, 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 yeah. especially with you know phones and, and everything at the speed of life that it is. Yeah. A strategy that I found helpful, and I think sometimes it makes others uncomfortable, but what I have to do because I if I really am listening to hear and understand then I give myself the grace of quiet time. Yeah. So that in that back and forth, rather than, okay, so I'm, I, I, this sounds crazy, but I'll give myself a literal 10 count of, okay, I'm, I'm really trying to process and understand what you just said. And sometimes I'll articulate that. Yeah. Let me, let me process that. So I, I think a huge, a huge piece of this starts, starts there one is striving for common ground and two is appreciating that there are two sides to this conversation not just yours but somebody coming at it probably as passionate about wherever they're coming from from their perspective as you are and so appreciate that you in it you might get smarter mm -hmm. along the way you might learn things that from your lens and perspective you hadn't even thought of you know, one of the things that you just said, it, it's very difficult. It's not an easy skill is to pause and listen to understand. And, and, and also just takes time. Like, like people don't are not comfortable with silence no. in a conversation. You know, one of the things that I um, had to learn when I was getting my master's degree in, in school counseling, and we had to you know, do a lot of um, activities around listening was this idea of the silent chair. It's like, you have to actually be able to look at somebody or look at a situation and just not speak. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy for me. I'm, I'm the person who wants to jump in. I told Tina that last time, and I think it's really difficult at times to listen. I guess the other piece, Heather, is with the, the nonstop of a school, the, 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 the thousands of things that are going on, all the activities, and we're trying to try to find time to have a, a conversation, a brave conversation with a colleague and sometimes it's we don't we don't feel like we have the time. So I think that in itself, absolutely, you on the fire because we don't give ourselves space and grace to do that. Yeah, and and I guess where I come from on that is that's absolutely true. And if you don't find the space in the time it happens, it's going to cost you so much time, energy, yeah. potentially progress later. Yeah. So do you want to spend the time now or are we going to let it trickle and and perhaps have a pretty negative impact if we don't? And that's kind of, you know, pertains to anything in life. If we don't take the time now, we're going to be paying later for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, um, in your 
in your book, and you talked about the at the end what you put together. I, mean, I think the template is is wonderful because it really just in 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 again. Um, people can't really see it, but it, it really does in one spot really help people understand like key steps, you know, the what, the why, and the how. But it, you, you just walk people through it. And it literally, if, if, and you said you don't have to use it all, but I would sit down and say, how can we practice this as teams? How can we practice this and work through it? And, and you talk about some scenarios at the beginning of the chapter. If we don't practice things, then it really becomes very difficult to actually make it work effectively. Yeah, you don't you don't go from sitting on a couch to running a marathon. Yeah, that's that's not how it works. So if you look at at really developing some finesse and confidence, even more than that, in conversations like this, you know that you have to practice them. Yeah. Um. So some strategies. I mean, I have a whole session where we take different frequently occurring scenarios that happen in team conflict. Yeah. And okay, now we role play it. And one person is the person causing the yeah. issue, at least from one perspective. Sure. It's interesting to see how that goes. Yeah. One person is conducting the crucial conversation. And then the third role I think is really, really important. Who, And that's the observer or the feedback provider. Mm. So here's the situation. We're clear right. on who's role playing what. And we have that third point out giving feedback on these steps and strategies. And I even structure it when we're first starting to practice. So let's say we're going from the couch to a brisk walk outside, aiming right. toward the marathon. Right. Okay, frame your feedback around these stems. I like the way you, Yeah. and maybe you could try. Sure. Just so you're not growing conflict in yeah. practice yeah. of this. Yeah. And you that's don't want, how you don't want to put people on the defensive. Not to, yeah. And yeah. they are, they are already, but what's great. Yeah. And I always say this, you know, to look at somebody else's hot mess is kind of fun and you can work on your skills, but it, you don't own it. Yeah. And so people will laugh, you know, it's, it makes it, it's uncomfortable because you're playing this role, but it's not as uncomfortable as it's my story. It's, it's, it's our team. And right after this conversation, we have to go have lunch together. Yeah or, or, or that, but, but it's absolutely true. Um, you know, if you have trusting friends that you can role play with, I just had a colleague do that. They're going to roll, they role played with me and I, to the best of my ability, stepped in as that other person, because I know them quite well Yeah. to, to practice that. But it's, it's, it's a really hard, it's like an essential standard. This yeah. is an essential standard of of leading. And yeah. I don't mean by title, I mean, yeah. leading by influencing and make and helping make progress. And, you know, as Rick said, we all have an obligation and an opportunity to influence every one of us. Yeah. Yeah. And so just thinking again about an entire staff and, and trying to make sure that people have an understanding that we're all going to have to be a part of brave conversations at some point or another, would you recommend uh, again, that the, the principal or the, the admin team, the, the leadership team uh, really work with the staff to make sure that they all are understanding how to work through this process. Because I could see on a team, if one person goes to like a, a conference and, and, you know, learns about brave conversations and then them running back to their team and saying, oh, we got to do this. But if everybody's not on board or if, if I'm on a team and there is a conflict and I know about brave conversations, but the other people don't. And I go in and I start talking about brave conversations. You're going to get pushed back or people are going to think you're a know it all. So how do we get common language, common knowledge and common expectations as a staff, as a team to make sure that we are able to, to lead this effectively? Well, I think, I think you, you back a step up and make sure whoever's leading that work has worked through the work themselves. Yeah. Um, so that they are on the same page, not necessarily, uh, each of us brings a style to this, right? Um, Rick would use sarcasm. Yeah. I don't use as much sarcasm as I try to use humor. Sure. Um, one of my principles uses sports analogies. Like you can find, sure. bring yourself to it. Yeah. But I think whoever's going to be, it's like Tina said, I, I teach the things I need to work most on. Yeah. So let's get really clear. So our admin team right now, each time we come together, we practice a, an okay. internal crucial situation, an internal thing, and we practice that skill yeah. so that we can bring it forward. I, I you know, I'm going to channel Becky again. Clarity precedes competence. So if this is something we're going to build capacity around, 
I would don't just jump into it. Define what this term means. Ask people to think about, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda. When what was a situation, personal, professional, whatever, where you coulda, shoulda, woulda. If this is what a brave conversation is, when's the time you coulda, shoulda, woulda, and what happened because you didn't. Sure. Now knowing we don't want to stay in that place, let's dig in to each of these skills. Let's dig in and what would it look like? What would it sound like? Let's watch one. Let's close watch this video. What do you see happening? I love that. Um, and, and practice it. And I also, Brian, think, you know how, I, I know you know this, people roll their eyes, especially in August and September, roll their eyes like crazy about team norms and collective commitments. Yeah. Don't you hear those all come to life yep. when you're thinking about this? Yeah. If we set a commitment, a collective commitment, that we're every decision we, we make is going to be through the lens of, is this what's best for the students we're blessed to serve? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it gives us an automatic common ground. And, and one of the things that, that you did say in terms of this process is really that you got to practice it. As, as an admin team, you will lose credibility if you go to your staff and say, do this without you. But I don't. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I hey, mean, you do more damage than good. I'd rather you not talk about it. Yeah. Then talk about it and not walk it. Heather, this has been great. This has been awesome. I want to make sure that I do justice to this. Thank you. When this book came out, when you and Julie and Jeannie wrote this book um, and I got it and I, my, my uh, admin team started reading it and we were like, oh my God, this is the book we should have written. Right. Um, and, but it, it really is it's what you were doing at Mason Crest. It yeah, was what but, you were so, doing. But, but when we talk about how we operate traditionally in our country, we've operated in such silos that it's so foreign to some, some people. Like I, I was coaching a, a special ed teacher just recently, and I was talking about just this idea of working with general ed teachers and sitting down at the table and you know, identifying essentials together and creating common assessments together. And even possibly, which was totally out of her, her thinking, possibly the team writing the IEP together. Yeah. Um, and she, it was so foreign to her. And I said, that, and actually she's, she ordered this book this week. Um, can you really just kind of talk about this idea of how do we get people to understand that it's kind of just ed? And that, and that we it's really, yeah. as teams, yeah. need to sit down and make sure that we have a 360 degree view of a child. So we have our different expertise at the table. Yeah. So you hear the puzzle with. piece, right? Yeah, exactly. Who, who are our absolute experts in the field to know before instruction begins, how they're going to be ready to scaffold that instruction, to jump in with a graphic organizer, build yeah. background knowledge, bring a text into highlighting those are our special educators and that's not to say a general educator yeah. can't but that's not something that they've necessarily been trained in right so bring that talent to the table who are the absolute positive experts on what grade level proficiency looks like general educators yeah so it's it's and the, we wrote yes we can because this is what we were doing and then we'd yeah. go out and work with schools and they were like, wait, what? No, we meet as special ed. Our yeah. our PLC time yeah. is special ed. Yeah. And they never talked to their course content or department. And we came back. The, I remember the day it happened. The three of us came back and said, I think we have a book here. Because yeah. what we're doing it, is it's, working. It's and amazing. People are acting like this is the craziest, yeah. but best thing they've ever heard. Yeah. So that's honestly, Brian, that's where it came from was just, well, what, what are we doing here that's moving the needle for kids? Because we're not throwing more people at it. We haven't adopted a brand new program. We right. At that time, it wasn't one-to-one -one technology. It wasn't the yeah. things. It was, how are we going to choose to work together? Yeah. And then we, we train the heck out of that because it's not just enough to build a master schedule right. where all these am amazing people have time to come together. It also requires... Why are we doing this? What asset do you bring to sure. the process? Yeah. And how can we rely on each other to really mean all means all? And to get them to rethink that it is just Ed and to think that if I'm, a special, if I'm a special ed teacher, me sharing my expertise at the team, I'm going to be helping other kids who might need support, but they don't have a quote label. Yeah, because yeah. we can predict that there will be kids who yeah. don't learn at the same pace as each other. Yeah. At whether they have letters or numbers that follow their name or not. Exactly. 
And we have two choices. We can be singleton silo teachers that that same scenario is happening to and go home at night and, and sit on a couch and be overwhelmed because just reteaching what was our best intent slower and louder yeah. is probably not going to work. Yeah. So if we lean to people who can see it and do it in a different way, awesome. And here's the great thing about a collaborative team such as that, maybe none of us know exactly. what a great shared learning opportunity. Yeah. Yep. But but first let's let's build the structures where we really get smart people working together. Yeah. Valuing each other, making the job easier. Gosh, helping helping our IEP entitled students see yeah. that all these caring adults are wrapping support around me. I'm not just out on special ed island with Mr. or Mrs. Blank. This yeah. is my team. Yeah. It's just it, 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 it can change kids' lives because we know even still nationally, Brian, only about 2% of students are exiting IEP yeah. entitlement annu annually. Yeah. yeah. So we have a lot of work to do, but but I I can get, there's not a lot in, in life I'll guarantee, but I will guarantee that if schools or teams start thinking in a yes, we can way and just start living and breathing some of those practices and perfect isn't the target, progress is. Exactly. Yeah. You're going to make a difference, not only for yourselves, in renewing your puzzle piece, taking yeah. the superhero cape off, but my gosh, the difference you're about to make for kids. Yeah, it, it's it's just an amazing book. And Thank you. This, this book, I read a ton of books and you know, this is one of my top 10 books all time. It literally is. Thank um, it, you, Brian. Amazing. So Heather, thank you so much. Um, if you all have not gotten this book, please get it. It doesn't matter thank who you, you are, women who lead, it's an amazing book. And Brian, can, if I can, can I share one anecdote just real briefly? Sure, so I, I passed women who lead on to one of my, um, one of the teachers that I, that I serve with here. She read my chapter, but then she lives, her mother-in-law lives with them. Her mother-in-law picked up the book, read the whole thing yeah, and said to, to my, my colleague, this has absolutely nothing to just do with education. It, it can, any, this, is, this is how, how any person contributes. Yes. This is how any person makes an impact. And that in its essence, obviously we're trying to help women have more access, feel the love and support of other strong women around them in the right. field, help males see this is, we're not so different, right? We're not so different. Like no. there's a chapter in the book written by our brave male colleagues to speak yeah. to this, but it's bigger than education. It's bigger than women. It's about being that positive impact on the world and and my chapter is not the best one in the book i'll tell you that right now you know, um, your chapter is amazing and and one of the things that i want to say as a man is that this is not just for women no it's for men and women and it really has helped me just reading your chapter reading jasmine's chapter reading all the chapters it really helps me start to think about my privilege and, and what i need to do to be an ally to support um, and to make sure that I'm not trying to, you know, mansplain or I need, you know, the people who have been my most um, influential mentors, most of them have been women in education. And, and so I, I am, you know, again, at the end of, you know, every you know show, I talk about this quote that, you know, I shared at my dad's funeral a couple, a couple of years ago. As I go, I am wearing you. 80, 85 to 90 percent of my professional people who I'm wearing are women who led me, who have supported me, who have you know took me under their wing and said, "This is you know I see something in you." Just like you said, people saw something in in you. Same thing happened with me. Yeah. So and I, I look at this point in my career as as the opportunity to take that and see it in others. Yeah. And gender gender regardless, yeah. just helping people. Yeah find find their next step, um, opening doors. What do you aspire to and how can I help you get there? Um, that's my legacy. Yeah. It, my legacy is that and that when I leave this school district, nothing changes. There's a different person in this office, but we've got the systems in place that keep kids learning at high levels and staff feeling like they are appreciated and an invaluable part of this culture. That's Jim Collins, level five leadership. But yep. I'm, I'm aiming for five. Yeah. Well, Heather, <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I truly, you know, really appreciate you coming on. You are Thank such you. an influential person in so many people's lives. And as I shared that quote, again, as I go, I am wearing you. 
I am wearing Heather Frizzell now and I have been for the last, you know, since we met. Thank you, Brian. It's absolutely my pleasure to count you as a colleague and as a friend. All right. Godspeed, friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.